Hello my goblins and ghouls, <laughs> my name is Steven. It's feeder time. When we last left off with feeders, we got them working and we got them working well through the protocol that Justin designed. Since then, we've been testing them in-house and we learned about three big things that we really need to change about them before they're ready to rock. One, they're too damn big. This thing is a mega uber chonker. It is 38 millimeters wide, which is fat. Especially for a tape that's only eight millimeters wide. Yeah, that's not great. That means you can't really fit that many of them on a machine. So that's definitely gotta change. That's the biggest thing we gotta change. Two, they're a little wobbly on the rail. They just drop straight on, but they don't really hold their position very well. They can kind of slide around. And the way that the feeder floor is designed, the spring fingers actually allow a bit of wobble because of the spring. So that's gotta change too. And lastly, the positioning motor and the cool little PCB encoder wheel that we have in there that tells the motor how far forward to move, it requires a kind of a dicey bit of calibration. I was hoping that the settings for like what constitutes a high signal from the reflective sensor and a low signal from the reflective sensor would kind of be universal and every feeder would have pretty much the same values. That's not true. <laughs> That's something that we learned as we made a few of these things to like actually put them through production testing. Each one had a different value, which is super annoying. And we really don't wanna have to have a whole calibration procedure for these things. As easy to manufacture them as we can, the better. So I'm gonna see if maybe there's a way that we can also make it so it doesn't need to have all these settings always be calibrated for each machine. That's just kind of a pain in the butt. So today, that's what we're gonna fix, those three things. I'm gonna try and fix those three problems and get these to a place where they're ready to rock. But how the heck am I gonna do that? So here's the current design. It's a chonker clocking in at 58 millimeters wide. Hey, is it actually 58? No, not 58. What are you saying, Haas? 38. Not great. That's 11 feeders on the front rail. So why is it so fat? If you'll remember from some of my early tests, I switched to a TT motor. And I did this because the N20 motor that I was using didn't feel like it had enough oomph. But then I was trying to passively peel the film with the drive motor. And that takes a ton more force to have happen instead of just moving the tape forward. Plus, I was also not using the most torquey gearbox on the right angle N20 that is available. You can get them with a lot more force. So it's pretty clear we have to scrap the TT motor. It's super powerful, but it's huge and it's unnecessary. And it's what's really making the feeder as fat as it is. So instead, we're going back to the right angle N20 motor. It's a ton smaller. It does still have a lot of force packed into it and it handles all of the right angle motion built into it because it has this little brass gearbox. I'm gonna dive in and see what I can do to redesign the feeder for this motor instead of the big old chonky TT, and hopefully we'll get something a little bit better and a little bit thinner. All right, I've got a pretty cool first pass. So this design has the right angle N20 motor fit right in here, and out of the gate, it's a ton thinner. I think this is closer to like 18 millimeters now. And you can see we still have the same wheel in here for actually driving the tape forward. But I've also done something to remove the huge annoying film peeling spool that we had on the last version. Instead, the motor that peels the film is all the way down here. And the film will actually come out of this top hole, wrap around the side of the feeder through this slot, and then get pinched between these two gears. And then this N20 motor with the worm gear on it will make these two gears spin and pinch the film and pull it. The gears are mounted on this gray PET G print, which has a little bit of preload between the gears to to make sure that there's a good amount of force grabbing the film and pinching it. But also once we hit the limit, it'll be able to slide through it because it's got a little bit of flexure to it. Also, this whole print is really easily removable with just a couple screws. So it's really easy to swap out for a different one and try different tensions. I'm gonna try and give this thing a whirl and see how well it works. Ha <laughs> ha! Okay, sweet, so, ooh, that's really bright. Okay, so that seems to work pretty darn well. I tried giving it a bit of resistance while it was pulling the tape and I was able to stop it, but it put up a fight. I was only driving at about seven and a half volts um, and we do have 24 volts in the feeder, so we might be able to PWM 24 volts into the motor to give it a little bit of extra boost, but even with like seven volts, which is totally within the range of these motors, it's totally fine. I'm not even a little worried about it. There's plenty of juice in this different gearing of the N20 than the one that I used last time. So now I need to get the film peeling working and I really hope this works because it does pull so much away from up above. This whole situation 
it's kind of a pain in the butt <laughs> and I'd love to be able to scrap all this up here. The second thing I'm trying to fix with this version is how do we know how far forward the tape has moved without using the reflective bit of this encoder wheel? It is kind of cool in the old versions that we were able to just put a PCB with some reflective bits on it and that was how we were able to tell whether or not the wheel has moved the correct amount. But because it requires so much extra calibration, I'm gonna try and get rid of it. And I'm gonna try and do this with an encoder. An encoder is something that you put on a spindle or a shaft of a motor to tell exactly how far it's rotated and in what direction. You can get these on the back of N20s. Here's one here. This little black circle actually has some magnets in it. And then these two little black parts on the board are actually detecting when the magnets go around. And you can tell how far it's rotated and in what direction based on that. I'll put a link in the description about encoders and how they work and the gray code that comes out of them if you want to learn more about how that works. But this is a straight shaft N20 and all of the ones that are right angle that have an encoder on the back take weeks to arrive. So Lucian and I made it a Chimera motor where we ripped apart an N20 motor with an encoder with a long extended shaft for the encoder on the back. And we took the gearbox, the right angle worm gear gearbox, and we like tried to glue them and bolt them together and it actually works. We have a tiny little right angle N20 motor with an encoder. So I'm gonna try and make that work and validate that we will be able to get accurate positioning with an encoder on the back of the right angle N20. I'm not sure how accurate encoder positioning will make the tape position because the encoder is actually attached to the spindle in the motor itself and not on the output shaft of the gearbox. And that's really what we care about because that's what's interfacing with the tape. And because we're only measuring what's on the motor, we're not capturing all of the error and the backlash that stacks up inside the gearbox. But I don't know, it may not matter, we'll see. Okay, so obviously it looks super bodgy, but it freaking works. It is super accurate with a little bit of software tuning. I found that the backlash in the gearbox really is not a problem. With a little bit of software tweaks, I found that we can always make sure that backlash is not an issue. At first, I start with peeling a little bit of film extra just at the beginning of every indexing sequence. And then I pull the film and I drive the motor forward at the same time until we hit the encoder position. And by doing that, there's never a chance that the film peeling is like pulling the tape forward and like making the backlash be compensated. It's always being moved to its position with the motor. So the encoder is always accurate. Also figuring out how to patch in encoder support and like PID positioning with an encoder into the feeder firmware was, it was a thing. <laughs> it took me a minute, but it works and it's really accurate. It's super, super precise. And then the second issue I'm trying to solve, which is the wobble, wobble, wobbliness on the rail. I've actually kind of been working on solving that too. Instead of just dropping straight onto the rail like the last version, this one kind of like pops in and hooks down and clicks into place. I'm still kind of working on tuning and tweaking this. I'm not really happy with it yet, but it is definitely on the right track and it feels so much more stable. This was an older print that I was working on and this one will actually pop on pretty well. For this one, I just tried to put a little built-in flexure in PLA, but I kind of want it to be a separate part than the rest of the PLA frame because I want things that are flexy and need to be able to move to be in PETG. So I'm probably gonna take this little flexure and break it out into a separate print that'll bolt into the original PLA one. But this whole like functionality of hooking onto the front edge of the rail and then popping down and locking into place, it feels like such a better solution. Of course, it looks incredibly messy with all this stuff hanging out of it, but I know that I can compress this all into a nice, neat little form factor again. I just need to get the new PCB made and a little bit of motor changes and stuff like that.
and clean this is. I am so stoked about this. This feels like such a nice, neat, clean little unit. And of course the PCB in here doesn't have any components on it and the motor isn't wired up and stuff. I'm waiting on the new boards that I designed that uh, fit this geometry of print now to come in so I can actually test it with the board being structural along with being like electrically driving the whole thing. Plus I'm waiting for more right angle N20s with encoders to come in. You also probably noticed that in the tests, I actually have the PCB that connects to the encoder is sticking up the side of the feeder right here. And that is not ideal and it totally kills the width. So we're working on trying to get that PCB rotated 90 degrees so it's still within the bounds of the width of the feeder. It just can't stick out the side. We gotta have it stick a different direction. And then the other thing that's sticking out here is the spindle of the N20. It actually comes out by like three millimeters or so. We're also gonna try and figure out a way to get that cut down so that it really does come into about, I think this is 15.5 millimeters wide is the final width I got on this. And I'm really stoked about it. It. I did the math and instead of 11 on the front rail, we can get 27 feeders on the front rail with a feeder this size, which is 54 total in the whole machine if you include the back rail, which is awesome. I'm really stoked about that. Oh, it's gonna be so good. Other things I still have to tune about this are the little flexure that grabs the rail into place. In general, it does pop onto a rail really well, but this gray flexure, uh, the geometry just isn't quite right yet. It doesn't hold the feeder onto the rail the way I want it to, and then removing it, pulling the flexure down, doesn't release it from the rail the way I want it to. It is probably fine as is, but I want it to be a little bit more robust. So it's actually a great thing that I can just unscrew them. It's really easy to just run like a seven minute print to print another flexure design, slap it on there, see if it works. I don't have to reprint the frame every time. This whole design, of course, totally invalidates the feeder floor design that we had before. So I'm gonna have to redesign the feeder floor to fit with this new style, but it should be pretty easy and straightforward. I just gotta make sure I can keep it 15 millimeters wide. That's really my goal. But aside from that, it shouldn't be too difficult. It's just so much better. It's so tiny. Like I can hide it behind my hand. <laughs> it's so small. Ah, oh, and the film peeling works so well. I'm so stoked about it. A little 3D printed worm gear, and it's more than enough to get the film to peel, and you can overdrive the film peeling motor a ton, run it way past the amount of film that actually needs to be peeled, and it slips right through the gears, no problem. It just makes sure that all of the available film has been peeled. It's awesome. I'm really, really stoked about it. I also like that it's pretty easily removable. You can just unbolt it, but so far with everything I've tested, this one tension that I've set, is more than enough. I might just set the tension so it has a lot of interface, a lot of uh, preload. So no matter what, no matter how much the film is stuck onto the tape, it will be able to grab it. It's not like we have any chance of stalling the N20 from peeling film. It's a really beefy little motor. And then that way we're just ensuring it's able to peel from pretty much any tape. What a neat little object, huh? Oh, I'm so excited. Anyway, that's it for this one. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Green screen time. Here we go, a green screen, baby. Other things I still have to tune a little bit are... You can leave me a message. This, of course, totally invalidates... That's a fire alarm. <laughs> okay. <laughs>